Kurt Smith is an English musician born on June 24, 1961 in Bath, Somerset. He is best known for forming the band Tears for Fears, along with childhood friend Roland Orzabal. Also a solo artist, he released his third album, Halfway Pleased, in May 2008. Smith grew up in Bath, England, and lived on the Snow Hill Council estate. He attended the Beach and Cliff School. His most recent release, Perfectly. Still. If the second song of an album-length project on which Smith is collaborating with artists he meets or discovers via social media. Smith married Frances Pennington in 1996. They live in Los Angeles, California, with their two daughters, Diva and Wilder. Ladies and gentlemen, Kurt Smith. Now that was funny. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I was, I was looking forward to um, seeing what they came up with. Um, I, I guess this is an automated search and it does it all and so this is what the internet knows about me. Um, which interestingly enough, I didn't know this was going to happen tonight. Um, but it kind of is part of what I was going to talk about anyway. So uh, it, w it works out well. I like the fact that the perfectly big pause still. <laughs> Um, that'll teach me to put dot, 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 dot in something. Um, so my talk tonight is called Into the Deep and Over the Edge. Um, let me see if I can get this thing to work. And uh, first, let me talk about that title. Um, it's actually a lyric from um, a track I've just completed with a girl called Melissa Kaplan, and it's part of this project that I'm doing um, with people who I, whom I meet through social media. And uh, this is actually the line, if you can hear it. Hans gets an old fish. Now, <clears throat> I gotta say, even though the song is not necessarily about what I'm gonna talk about, um, it is saying um, about those experiences you have where you've gotta confront things that you're actually not very comfortable with. Now, you may or may not notice, this is not what I'm comfortable with, particularly. Um, it's not what I do. Um, what I normally do, and where you may know me from, um, is recording as a recording artist. These are the various Tears for Fears albums. And what's known of me is what you heard at the beginning. Actually, a bit more information than I thought, and I'm shocked that there's a picture of my kids on the internet somewhere. But, um, and then what I'm used to doing, and even that, and it was interesting coming in because the next shot uh, was taken this year, and this was in Manila. And um, another reason why this is a little different for me, if you see the subtle difference. I'm there looking down. And now you're all here looking down on me. <laughs> on my own, waiting for me to say something vaguely poignant, one would presume. Um, and if you were the singer, I mean, like the young people who sang Mad World beforehand, who I thought were, you know, to me it's wonderful to hear young kids singing a song that was kind of intended for people that age to sing. Um, you know, the same uh, meaning doesn't hold for me because I'm a bit older and I'm not an angry young man. I'm a crotchety middle-aged man now. And <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes it's great to remember actually where, where the initial inspiration came from and it's really intended to be sung by children that age. But they may look at this picture as aspiring musicians and say, wow, that's what I want to do. That's, that's so great. I... Unfortunately, when I see that picture, and I had to ask myself this question yesterday, um, what do I see when I see that picture? I see me, and a big barrier, and then them. That's what I see. Um, and I've always found it weird, and whether you know my history or not, um, I actually left the band Tears for Fears back in 1990 and, and sort of disappeared for nearly 10 years. I, I moved to New York, which is a fantastic place to disappear to, I have to say, because um, no one cares who you are there. <laughs> and um, th the reason was I was just so uncomfortable with the fame side of it. And I found it very strange when I played shows, um, especially at the, the height of our fame. And, and I guess I left pretty much still at the height of our fame. When um, people would literally, I mean, I had an occasion in Canada where I'm leaving 
um, a, a concert to just to get to the bus, which is probably there. And between here and there, my shirt had gone, disappeared. It had been ripped off my back. Now, me, being the way I am, I'm thinking, why? These people don't even know me, and why would they want to do that? And um, I'm, I'm listening to all the speakers earlier um, in the first half of the program, and it's interesting because, um, and I will get on to reasons why afterwards, but uh, I disagree on one level with what Jaron says, and obviously he is a person of intelligence far higher than my pay grade. But um, the whole thing about social media impersonalizing things, well, for me, it can do the opposite. It actually can do the opposite. And um, for me to sort of do this still, I feel the need, there's like an inborn need that people need to know who I am. Not just that guy. Um, not just, you know, he lives in Los Angeles, he is married to Frances Pennington. Um, you know, because Frances Pennington actually has a whole boatload of history of her own. Um, and she's not just the person that's married to me. So let's go on. I d I've decided basically at this point that I kind of am searching for something else. I mean, that picture kind of says it all. How do I deal with that? And the only way to deal with that is to try new things. So my talk is kind of why as opposed to why not. And um, reasons to go over the edge. Well, the foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. And, and I was. I was at a stage where... I can do this, this is what I do, and I'm quite comfortable doing it, but I'm not completely satisfied with, with doing this, and so how do I find something else? Now, all this is happening at a time, by the way, that the music industry, as, as I know it, and I don't know how many of you are involved in the music industry, um, or know people that are, but you may or may not know the mus music industry is pretty much dead. It's in, in a state of chaos right now. Um, due to the music business's own stupidity, I have to say, um, in the fact that they never understood that people want a different, different delivery system of music. So they spent all their time and money suing people instead of trying to find out a way how to monetize something. And thanks God, Steve Jobs came along and kind of solved that one on their behalf. So what happens when a state, an industry, any industry is in this state of disarray? Well, all the, all the rules are out the window. The rules are, have completely disappeared. And the way it used to be, um, me as an artist, um, everything was sort of planned. You know, obviously a release date is planned, a recording is planned down to, there's a publicist who will talk to you about, you know, how you should be imaged and how you should talk to people. I've even had to go through media training. It was the most hideous thing I've ever done in my life. Because um, I ended up not sounding like me. You know, I ended up like someone trying to just sell a product. And, and I don't find that particularly interesting. So, that was gone, then there was video, and you, someone would image that and make you look a certain way. And what happens is you get a one-dimensional image of people. And so the one-dimensional one image of me was, and, and I believe of Tears for Fears, and it's still interesting to this day, when I meet people, they, they, they actually say, you're not quite what I expected. Um, that's not the person I expected you to be. Um, number one, Apparently, me having a sense of humor is not what they expected. Because we talk about, I mean, you'll listen to a track like Mad World, but when we started, you know, we had songs like Suffer the Children, Ideas as Opiates. It was kind of heady and it was dark, and, and, but that's just how I use, use music. I mean, I use music to talk about things that I find confusing, things that I find hurtful. If I'm happy, I don't write songs, because I'm too busy actually being happy. I mean, I just don't need to write a song about it. I, I just don't. And, and I, I don't want to sit there and go, and of course, I'm a huge, as any musician, Beatles fan. But I, I'm incapable of writing, I love you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just, I wish I could. I, I'd be a lot wealthier. But um, <laughs> it's not what I use music for. For me, it's, um, it's about getting out emotions and emotions that I probably was brought up um, not being able to express. Music, I was actually asked once, you know, why I became a singer, specifically, and musician. I mean, I'm known more for singing than anything else, but, uh, and my answer was, and I actually didn't think about it, and afterwards I thought, God, I'm deep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my answer was, it gave me a voice. That was my answer. That was my honest answer. And, and 
I didn't realize the depth of that until afterwards, and so of course I'm really not that deep, but um, it was, it was how I expressed myself. I wasn't allowed to do that at home. I wasn't allowed to complain about things at school. I grew up in an era where young boys should be seen and not heard, basically, and you're there to learn and listen and not talk back and just, you know, you're kept in your place. So that's how I use music. So again, going over the edge and why, you know, me, next year I turn 50, by the way, so me at this age going, I'm still missing something. Um, and then being at a point in my industry where there are no rules. So I sit and go, well, there's, you know, there are other things you can do. Another reason, um, you know, The Onion being one of my favorite magazines. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and this is a report about 10 million people killed annually by <laughs> stepping outside of their comfort zones. And that kind of spoke to me because I'm like, you know what, I am stuck in this. I mean, yes, I can get up and sing in front of, in that case in Manila, was I think 12 or 13,000 people. A and they were noisy, it was like a big karaoke concert, it was ridiculous. But um, yet I'm feeling slightly ungratified by it because I feel they don't really know me that well. So then I, can, I, I come to the conclusion, um, you know, with talking to various people that, well, why not embrace the fact there are no rules anymore? Um, you know, you have two, two options. Um, if whatever industry you're in, and in my case, the music industry, um, when the rules are thrown out the, the window. Because what will happen is new rules will come along. They will. It's, it's called evolution. And people have talked about that. And we evolve into better, more adapt. We adapt better. We, we, we evolve, into, evolve into better working versions of the, the same thing, effectively. But it's just waiting for those rules to come along and for people, because it's trial and error. You know, you basically have to go through a whole bunch of things, and then eventually you work out, ah, that one actually works, that one doesn't work, that one works, that one doesn't work. So it's a time to either A, sit by the sidelines and watch while someone else makes all the rules, or B, get up off my ass and sort of be involved in it and see, you know, where it goes. So I decided, basically, I'm going to start trying a few different things and see, you know, where they lead. So ba just in the last year, and this is me personally, um, I actually did do a talk before at TED, which was as mortifying as this one is for me. Um, and, and that, but interestingly, each of these things I actually learned something from, and, and even though it's not what I expect to learn from it, at least I'm learning something, and I'll, I'll get back to the TED Hollywood one, because it was a different lesson. Um, Believe it or not, in all these years I've played, I've never played solo with an acoustic guitar ever. I've always actually had a crutch. I've always had my partner, a backing band, people with me. Had never played solo. And so I was asked to do this um, Comic-Con event with a TV show called uh, Psych, which I actually guest starred on in the difficult role of myself playing a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and. They asked me to go perform at Comic-Con and sing a song playing on my own. This is the first time at 49 I've ever played on my own with an acoustic guitar in front of an audience. Since then, I actually do it at every show for a song or two. Um, going back, obviously, the, the automated um, Googler, for want of a better description, um, talked about this project I'm doing. And because all the rules are thrown out the window, I thought, you know, what, musically, what shall I do next as a solo artist? Tears are kind of, you know, we, we're set in our ways as Tears for Fears, me and Roland work together, so that works as it is, but I, I still want to do other things. And, and it came to me um, by accident. A lot of these things come to, to people by accident, as, as um, was attested in a few of the, the talks earlier um, uh, with, again, um, Jaron, when he was talking about the avatar and, the, and becoming, you know, getting inside the big finger and all the rest of it. That sounded all wrong, didn't it? <laughs> getting inside the big finger. Uh, <coughs> he, um, you know, it suddenly by accident, by, by one zero, a difference of what he thought maybe, a, well, it would have been a zero or one, obviously, um, that his foot, his, his arm was now a mile long yet he could still control it, and then that turned into something else, and then eventually you get the movie avatar, and so what uh, ostensibly was an accident to start with turned into something else completely. So again, by coincidence, I'm, I've, I'm, I've written this song called All Is Love, and, and I feel I want a cello on it, because um, it that's just has that mood, a certain mood that only cello has, and I didn't know any. So I decided, well, why not just go on Twitter? 
and just search cello. And so I did, and the wonderful Zoe Keating came up. Um, she's Zoe Cello on, on Twitter. And actually on the TEDx uh, San Francisco page, that's her music at the beginning. She lives just outside of San Francisco. So before, I'd used to have to go through a record company, through a manager, through someone to find someone to get to someone to try and get them to, and then that manager would negotiate with this manager and, and you know, you'd come to some kind of deal and then a month later, something may get done. I tweeted, would love to work with at Zoe Cello, on Twitter, obviously. And um, eight minutes later, she tweeted back, would love to. And so our collaboration was born, just one to one. So social media allowed me to speak to Zoe directly, as opposed to dealing with a whole bunch of layers of different people that have a vested interest in what you do. Um, and we never met until she gave me the 83 cello tracks that she put down. Um, and Melissa Kaplan, the person who I did the, fir the, the first song you heard, um, Melissa I met through MySpace. I just emailed her through MySpace. And we still haven't met. And she did all that track. Um, this trip, I've actually met someone else at lunch today while I was up in San Francisco who lives around here. She's doing this wonderful Smiths project with all voice, a girl called Janice. And, and, and me and Janice are now doing a track together. I've also launched a web series about music called Strip Down Live. Um, that goes out every Wednesday night, and I'm finding out things about... It's, it's basically me getting excited about new music. So in the end, it's kind of what lessons do I learn from all this? And I'm not saying I've found the way forward yet, because I haven't. Um, but I'm stumbling my way through it. And the whole point is that creativity, any form of creativity, and I was bored because I wasn't being creative. That's what I felt. And unless you exercise it, it's going to do you no good. And the whole point of just being comfortable with something I've discovered is pretty hideous. Comfort is, I don't know, is it something in me? I mean, a lot of people are actually quite happy to be just comfortable. I'm, I'm not. I kind of, I want to test what it is I'm capable of doing. Because through that, I may find something else. And then you find out there's so many different discoveries. I mean, we talked about Jaron and, and the Avatar earlier. But um, there were two uh, professors in England who just discovered this amazing thing called graphene that they got the Nobel Prize for, for this year. Um, and they did that by just getting a pencil and like shaving it and getting a little piece of sticky tape. And it became atomic parcels of, of graphite, basically. And, and all these things will be in your TV screens next because it's the thinnest, thinnest and strongest material discovered yet. Um, Viagra was actually <laughs> discovered in Wales, where my wife is from, in Merthyr Tidville, uh, but it was a, supposed to be an angina drug, and it had a, apparently a pleasant side effect um, <laughs> to some. Um, the insulin pump was originally actually made for just a device to give medication, and it wasn't actually for insulin, it was just to give sp uh, very precise um, amounts of actually chemotherapy, I believe, initially. The telephone, that's actually not about a telephone. Um, it's actually about a song called One is the Loneliest Number. And, and actually, this has happened to me before, but Harry Nilsson wrote that song when he got a busy signal on a phone. And it was just, uh, 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 and he left the phone there, and he wrote the song to that rhythm and did it in 10 minutes, and the song was finished. Um, so inspiration can really come from anywhere. And so for, for me, the question then became, you know, it's not why, but, but why not? Now. I will leave on a little side note and go back to that um, TEDx Hollywood event I did. And, and I do love listening to other speakers, don't get me wrong, I, I do. And, but I, I did spend 20 minutes listening to, to one guy who was incredibly smart and very eloquent. Um, and he was telling, me, telling everyone about um, a marketing campaign that he did for Pepsi. And it had all the right buzzwords, you know, viral. Um, ecology, more green, involved in community, um, all the rest of it. And um, I got to the end of it, and I'm left with the thought, I, I'm still not going to drink Pepsi. <laughs> I actually prefer Diet Coke. <laughs> and that's just me. So <laughs> the other thing, I mean, for me, which I'll leave on, um, is, you know, it's really a lot of the time all about the product, uh, and you've got to make sure that's good. And my final words would be, and a word of advice for anyone, which is value what you do 
but please never overvalue what you do. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>